Hello, folks. Welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. How are you today? I hope you're doing well. Now then, this is, I believe, episode, I think probably episode 613, and it's another murder mystery story, uh, detective story, part two. So if you haven't already heard part one of this, then I suggest, strongly suggest, that you go back and listen to that. Episode 612, I think that is, and it's called Another Murder Mystery Detective Story, part one, I believe. So listen to part one before you listen to part two. Now, what happened in part one? We are investigating the uh, murder of three uh, uh, prominent academics, uh, a, a teacher, a surgeon, and a historian. And we're trying to find out what's going on. And it seems like it's some sort of weird religious uh, organization or philosophical cult or something. We've managed to track down some uh, very upper class person called Orthrus. Orthrus, who sort of speaks like this with a bit of a lisp for some reason. I've decided to do that. And if you remember, we checked the floorboards and we discovered that there's a secret hatch under there with a smell of incense. This is all very mysterious. I don't really know what it means, but is Orthrus the killer? If you remember, the, the cliffhanger ending that we had in the last episode was that we were about to open the um, the trap door, but Orthrus seemed to be sort of stepping backwards and glancing nervously at a cabinet drawer. I think there's a gun or something like that in there. Uh, so I think that before we open the trap door, we need to confront him to make sure he doesn't attack us. So I'm confronting him. Yes, it was the right decision. You rise to your feet and dart towards Orthrus before he can reach the cabinet drawer. He pulls it open and tries to grab a small pistol out of it as you tackle him to the ground. You and him both go crashing to the floor as the glun as the gun clatters harmlessly away like it usually does in Hollywood films. You know, the gun, the gun slides across the floor. You're under arrest, you bark. Mardler restrains Orthrus as you go back to the trap door and break it open. You lift the door and enter the subterranean chamber. The smell of incense floods your nose as you look around the dimly lit room. There's a man in the corner Stripped naked, tied up and drugged, but still breathing. He would have been killed this night had you not acted. So yes, we just saved a man's life. Let's have another look at this man who's tied up and naked and drugged in the corner. The man's name is Richard Zeke, a famous British scientist with intentions to be part of the Fulton Convention, a renowned scientific convention scheduled to take place in London in three days. Scientists from all over Europe will be attending. So Richard Zeke famous British scientist who is going to take part in this convention where loads of other scientists he's the one who's been kidnapped what's going on um let's continue and find out so chapter two the wolf is complete and we got 10 out of 11 points because I failed to go around that uh, guy in the street if you remember so later that night, in your apartment, with Clyde Orthrus arrested and locked away to be put on trial, you rest a little easier. You searched the underground room at the Orthrus estate and discovered many journals and notebooks documenting Orthrus's actions. Wanting to understand him better, you took the writing home and began analysing it. Apparently, Clyde Orthrus had begun following the teachings of an ancient Indian religion, worshipping a King Cobra-like god. This god, Kolubrigem, holds knowledge as the greatest achievement. Orthrus had been partaking in rituals in which the heart of someone intelligent is eaten to gain their brilliance and creativity. Ugh. A cannibalistic practice, consuming someone's body in an attempt to absorb their spirit. The writing is vague and oftentimes abstract, but it's clear to you that there was more than one person involved in killing and consuming. You open up another notebook and immediately see that the handwriting is quite different than Orthrus's. The faint scent of perfume, Muso Aime, wafts past your nose. Where have you smelt that recently? Do you remember in part one of this story, there was one point where we were talking about our sense of smell and uh, was it the coffee on the guy's breath? And was it, where was that? At the hospital? I think that was at the Hollow Leaf Hospital, wasn't it? I think it was there. Let's check. Yes, <clears throat> of course. The nurse that passed by you when you entered the hospital was wearing the same rare French perfume. You decide it's worth investigating her, seeing as she worked in close proximity to the second victim, Dr. Matthew Ander. 
So if we go back to the hospital, do I have to remember the accent that I used for the for that guy who was there? Anyway, so continue. Soft moonlight floods through the thick London fog as you make your way to the Hollow Leaf Hospital. Most of the doctors and nurses have gone home for the night, but a few stragglers, as people who kind of stay behind, a few stragglers are left caring for the sick and wounded. You walk over to the room that you remember seeing the perfume-wearing nurse enter the other day. There's a sick patient in the bed, sleeping soundly. The room barely lit enough to see. You notice subtle motion behind you, moments too late. Oh dear, something behind us. Thunk! A long needle digs into your arm as you jump back in surprise. You can feel an instant surge of drugs being pumped through your body as you stumble backwards, already becoming dizzy. Your vision begins to blur and your breathing becomes shallow. Oh my God, and there's a picture of someone emerging from the shadows and sticking a needle in my arm. The last image you see is the nurse standing over you, grinning wickedly. (laughs) An evil nurse! And then everything grows dark. You're falling... You're falling an, un- an e- you're falling an inconceivable height for an impossible amount of time. Your senses are distorted, and with them goes your grip on reality as you dip into a deep slumber. You sort of pass out. Oh dear. Hello there, sleepy head, says the nurse as you fade back into consciousness. You're stripped naked and tied to an old wooden chair, hands behind it, your body slowly overcoming the feeling of being numb. Numb is when you can't feel anything. As you look around the room that you're being held captive in, sunlight pours in through an open window to your right. You can smell that familiar odour of incense, among other things. Your hearing is still a bit fuzzy, but it comes back quickly, just like your sense of smell. It's as if your senses are going full throttle, to reboot and evaluate the situation. The nurse pulls out a large revolver and waves it in your face. Wakey, wakey, she laughs. Are you alive? I'm going to give you a little test. Who am I? You take a deep breath, still fighting the effects of the drug. All right, so we've got got various things to check out, all these smells, the sunlight, the look around the room, uh, the nurse. Let's have a look at the nurse. Your kidnapper is a tall woman with long flowing blonde hair. She has an enormous grin, which in context is terrifying. The woman wears a speckled necklace and a slim black dress. Her blue eyes are locked on you. Oh dear. Uh, Let's see. Let's look around the room. Where is this strange building? Fresh wallpaper, unscratched wood floors and a steam radiator in the corner. Out of the corner of your eye, you can see a three-foot-tall copper statue of a coiled king cobra, complete with sharp metallic fangs. Hmm. Um, So, sunlight pours in. What time is it? You are unconscious for a long time. It looks like it's almost noon. And um, what about these smells? You smell fresh meats and bread waft in through the window. Judging by the spices, you figure you're surrounded by cuisine from Slavic countries. <laughs> you also catch the salty odour of the Thames at low, t- low tide, very close by. Okie dokie. So where are we then? Um, the nurse, she's got one of those necklaces on. She's mean and cruel. We look around the room. It's plain room. There's a radiator in the corner. It's about noon. We can smell the smells of cooking stuff, Slavic food. And we seem to be close to the River Thames. The hearing, what can we hear? My hearing is still fuzzy. Someone's shouting outside. Oh, dear. <laughs> no, it's in another language. I'm going to make a fool of myself. Mieso nas prezidas. Is that Russian? No. Ukrainian? No. It's hard trying to focus. Mieso nas prezidas. Sorry to whoever's language that is. So, who is she? Whomp. Your head cracks backwards as the woman slams the butt of the revolver against it. Pff. Who am I? Why did I take you here? She shrieks. Fail the test and I'll shoot you. Your Clyde Orthrus's accomplice, you cough. (coughs) 
You're a worshipper of Colombrigen, the intellect-eating god, and you're going to eat my heart. The nurse nods her head, impressed. Well, you should know, I only eat hearts of the smartest people. So it's time for test number two. Where are you? Just then, you hear the chime of Ericsburg clock tower in the distance. I'll give you until the twelfth stroke, says your kidnapper. Oh, God. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Where are we? In the Seaboard District, the Lidka District, the Riviere District, the Egg... Galantine District, Rachelson District, or the Bozdar District. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, Ericsburg Clock Tower. Okay, I'm going to Google it because I can. This is a nightmare. Hold on a minute. Let's see if I can find Ericsburg like that. Let's see if I can just Google. I'm like literally Googling it letter by letter. Mm. I don't find anything for Ericsburg Clock Tower doesn't seem to be a real place seaboard district where's that oh come on let's make this quick it's a made-up place as well isn't it yeah that's a made-up place lidka district riviere district a galantine district rachel st bosdor oh it's got to be riviere district because i'm near a river but i just don't want to spend ages googling everything i'm just going to choose that it's it's wrong uh, Rongo spits the woman as she clubs your kneecaps with the butt of her pistol. Oh, God. You wince in pain. But you get consolation points for guessing a district so close to where we really are, within a mile or so, so I won't kill you right out. We're in the Bozidar district, dummy. Your kneecap and head are throbbing. Here's test three. Last one. I promise... Last one, I promise. Are we in the slums of Bozidar District or the middle class ring? No peeking out of the window. That's cheating. The woman sticks the gun up under your jaw. So which is it? Oh, bloody hell. I don't remember all of the information that we've been given. I don't think we're in the slums. Smells like good food near the clock tower. A nice nice room that we're in. Middle class. Yes. <coughs> middle class, you choke. Correcto, cries the woman. She's really annoying, isn't she, this woman? Very good. I bet your heart is delicious. I know I said no more tests, but here's a quick one. I'm thinking of a number between one and a hundred. What is it? Ha ha ha. She laughs at her own joke a bit too hard. I'm just kidding. Oh, bloody hell. She's annoying and crazy. Allow me to introduce myself, says the woman as she brushes her long blonde hair away from her eyes. My name is Claire Embridge. No need for an introduction from you, of course. I've read about your cases in the paper loads of times. Then when I saw you trapped Clyde before I arrived at his house, I knew you were really smart. You're a clever one. I figured it was only a matter of time before you'd come after me. But I didn't think you'd be this fast. You won't get away with this, you know, you say. Claire chuckles. (laughs) I'm pretty sure I will. If I'm confident enough to tell you my name, then there's a good chance I'm going to consume your heart. I mean, if you if you got free now, I'd have to flee off to the countryside, but I'm really beginning to like London. Do you realise you killed my best friend, you say? I'm not going to let you get away with that. Don't think of it as a killing. Think of it as, as absorbing. Which one was your friend? The musician? Surgeon? Historian? I'm going to guess historian from that frowny face. You know, I picked him out myself. I knew he'd be deliciously intelligent. You focus your mind on escaping this prison, half turning out, half tuning out Claire's annoying voice. You know, it's not so unnatural to practice cannibalism, continues Claire. Loads of animals do it. Sharks, pigs, even chimpanzees. King Cobras exclusively eat snakes. Their entire diet is a form of cannibalism. You look Claire in the eyes. But it doesn't work like that, you say, suddenly starting to sound like Jason Statham. But it doesn't work like that. You can't absorb someone's spirit if you eat their flesh. Thoughts aren't something you can magically transfer between people. Ooh, shun the non-believer, says Claire jokingly. What are you, a godless heathen? My mentor used to always say, Don't worry, Claire. You're after their intellect, not their faith. She looks around the room. We need more incense. I'll be back in a minute. Don't go anywhere, brainy. Claire turns and skips out of the room playfully. 
This may be your only chance to escape. You can manage to scoot the old wooden chair that you, you're tied to a few inches at a time, so you'll have to act fast. What do you do? Go towards the window, the statue, or the radiator? Oh, God. Right, hold on. There's a clue about the mentor. If we can read that. Let's have a look at what her mentor... Claire Embridge has a mentor. So there's at least one more active Columbrigem worshipper. Oh, God. So let's go back. If we can, please. Click. So go towards the window. Uh, and Sounds like there's people shouting outside, so I think the window's probably not a good idea. The Columbrigem statue, that's this big cobra with fangs. I reckon you could break off one of the fangs and use it as a weapon. Well, the radiator is a steam radiator, which maybe you could use to fill the room with steam, and then you escape, because they can't see you. I'm going for the for the dagger. I reckon it's the, the statue. Come on, let's do this. Is it the right choice? Yes. You quickly scoot the chair across the wooden floor towards the copper statue. You position your your tied hands next to the statue's fangs and rub them together until the ropes tear and snap, just like in a movie. You know, there's always like a thing that you can ru- rub the ropes against and it cuts the, the rope, right? So you do that against the statue. Um, you can hear Claire returning as you finish, untying the knots and stumble to your feet. The drugs have left you still somewhat impaired. With the wall as support, you slide towards the open window. You're three stories up. Claire re-enters the room with a handful of incense. Hey, get back in your chair, she screams as she draws her pistol. You clamber up onto the windowsill. Don't move a muscle, Claire rushes towards you. You let yourself fall. Bang! You feel a bullet rip through your back as you careen out of the open window and down towards the street. You crash into the hard ground, stunned and bleeding. Oh my goodness, are we going to survive? Let's continue. Ooh, that hurt. Everything's gone black. That hurt a lot. Your body feels like one big mass of pain. It's a challenge to stand, but you know you have to, or Claire will rip you apart and eat your heart. You see a blindingly bright light and feel a reassuring warmth. Then there's that laugh, that warm, comforting laugh of your best friend. You look up and see Julian Ashworth standing above you, hand outstretched. What? Are you ready to come with me? He asks kindly as he stands in front of the warm light. Oh dear, no, this is an image of like, he's close to death, isn't he? It's like the long dark tunnel with the light at the end and Julian's there saying, come with me. I'm not going to go with Julian. I'm going to fight the pain and stand on my own. Right, that's what I choose to do. Yes, is the right idea. Not yet, you say. You push yourself up and the light fades along with Julian. Now it's just you struggling to stand. So that was just like a near-death experience. Let's carry on. Oh dear, there's more of this Slavic language now. Panye, wish your... I can't do it. I just can't do it. So you imagine a Slavic language. I don't know how to say those words. Very disappointing. I know some of you are like, what? I demand that you speak my language and get it wrong. Um, a young boy, no older than 12, asks you as you open your heavy eyes. You snap back into focus. He's speaking Polish. Sorry, guys. I don't speak Polish. I'm terribly sorry. And he said, mister, are you all right? You respond in Polish. I need a doctor. In a few seconds, there's a crowd of people around you helping you onto your feet and carrying you. You're swept through the streets as you once again fade into darkness. Mm Mm-hmm. Fade into darkness, says Luke, as he closes the blind, because it was a bit bright. Oh, okay, so you've been shot by this crazy woman, Claire Embridge. You jumped out of the window, and you can speak Polish somehow, and um, then suddenly a crowd of people are carrying you away. They're going to save me. The good people of Poland are going to save me. You feel as though you're floating through a void, endlessly spiralling. Wake up. I'm going to choose to wake up. I'm waiting to wake up. I'm going to edit out these silences. But on the video, you get this free. Free silence. Wake up. That's annoying. It's not working. (laughs) how's it going for you though have you uh 
Have you sort of uh, followed the story so far? What do you think is going to happen next? The good people of Poland, I think, are going to carry me away and they're going to nurse me back to health with all that lovely Polish food and beautiful Polish women will come to my bedside and uh, will sit and and, uh, sit with me. And it'll be like a scene out of that film Witness starring Harrison Ford where he gets shot and a group of people from a different culture help to nurse him back to health and he falls in love with one of them. Okay, the text is back. (laughs) Little random tangent there. Okay. So I've chosen to wake up. You lazily lift your heavy eyelids, glancing round your hospital room and orienting yourself. There's someone sitting across the room, looking through a folder. Mardler? Ah, oh, you're awake, says Mardler as he puts away the file. One of the doctors here recognised you and sent word to Scotland Yard. I decided I'd come out here and get you. Vacation's over. Ah, oh, jokes. Hilarious. Mardler continues. So what happened? Yesterday, you were seen falling out of a window, naked, with a bullet in your back. You've been asleep since then. What's going on? Clyde Orthrus isn't the only Colin Brigham worshipper, you say. He had an accomplice, Claire Embridge, and she had a mentor. I almost had Claire, but she caught me off guard. So where is she now? asks Mardler. Oh, bloody hell. Um, is it Bozidar District or Winterdale or on her way to Poland? I'm going to say Winterdale because she had that necklace. Do you remember? Winterdale, it is. Yes, I'm right. Winterdale, you utter as you wince in pain. It's a small countryside town a few hours west of London by train. Mardler furrows his brow. She told you this. She told me that if I escaped, she'd be forced to flee to the countryside, you say. She was also wearing a speckled necklace, the same style as those that are customary in Winterdale. I glanced at a book about it when we were at Orthrus's house. That also explains why he had books about Winterdale, because they were there for Claire. I'll go with some men and check it out, says Mardler, as he rises from his chair. I'm going with you, you say, as strongly as you can. You force yourself with great effort to sit up in the hospital bed. You're in no condition to travel, replies Mardler. You need rest. You're in traumatic pain. No, I'm just upset that Claire stole my favourite sweater, you retort. You you can't come with, says Mardler stubbornly. Mardler, I'll be frank, you say. Claire is too smart. You're going to need me, or you'll screw this up. She can't escape again. Mardler take a step, takes a step closer to your hospital bed. I know you want revenge for Julian, he says, but I can't have you dying out there. Mardler sighs, <sighs> running his hand through his hair. A lot of people run their hands through their hair in this. If you can stand and walk, you can come, but, if you, but you have to take it easy. No gunfights or chasing suspects. Leave that to me and the rest of the force. Change your clothes and we'll go. I admit your help is invaluable, he said, becoming um, Michael Kane. You continue. You bump along the police carriage towards Winterdale as thick fog brushes up against the windows. It's evening now as you grip the wooden cane and the bottle of painkillers that you were given as you departed the hospital. What had you experienced back there on the fringe of life? What, have you, what had you seen? Was it A, a spiritual vision, or B, a drug and shock-induced hallucination? Spiritual vision or a hallucination? I'm going for hallucination, folks. Don't believe in the spiritual vision stuff. You were wounded and high. It's no wonder you saw some strange things. But still, you can't help but reflect and revisit uh, the old fragmented memory of your near death. You feel a sharp jolt of pain as the carriage hits a large bump in the windy road. Your stitches are very, still very much sore. So, should you take a pain pill to ease the agony or fight the pain without medicine? Well, I think the pain pill is going to dull my senses and so it's going to make me uh, less uh, effective as a detective. So, I think I'm going to fight the pain without medicine. You resist the urge to take a pain pill, taking deep breaths and gazing out into the heavy fog. Cold beads of sweat roll down the side of your face as we enter Winterdale. The carriage arrives in Winterdale, a quaint village. You, Mardler, and four Scotland Yard officers step out into the mist. You and Mardler go to the local tavern, hoping to have a pint. No, hoping to find out where Claire Embridge lives and maybe having a pint while they were there. So we go and try and find out where Claire Embridge lives. Let's continue. Oh no, 
Sometimes the page doesn't load. Maybe it's because I've loaded so many pages so far in the story. Anyway, what was my fantasy that I was going to get uh, nursed back to health by beautiful Polish women? <laughs> but that's not what happened. Instead, I came to and was rescued by Mardler. And then we're going to go to Winterdale to try and find out where Claire Inbridge lives. And we're going to take her down to Chinatown. Come on, let's continue the story. We don't have much time to waste. We've been going for 27 minutes. I don't want this to get uh, even slightly uninteresting. Okay, we're back again. So I've managed to make the website uh, reload. And uh, so it's time to carry on. I'm going to unpause and keep going. Okay, so if you remember before, we went to Winterdale to track down uh, this woman, um, Claire Embridge, who is part of this weird cult that eats people's hearts, like intelligent people's hearts, in order to steal their intelligence all right so uh, she nearly killed us me you us and uh, we're now going to go to winterdale which is where this cult is based in order to try and find her and we've just head to the local pub in order to uh, see if she's there so continue supported by the cane you limp into the tavern there's not many people there only a barkeep cleaning glasses like a barman an old man eating soup and a younger man in the back with a drink in his hand. Let's have a look at these people. The barman. You approach the barman, John Ulrich, and ask him about Claire Embridge. Yeah, I remember her, he says. I haven't seen her in a while, but she grew up here in Winterdale. The barkeep is a middle-aged man, probably around 40, and has light blonde hair. That guy eating the soup, Quentin Lynch, used to know her, says the barkeep. He's taking a train to London later tonight. Impressive, considering his age, don't you think? He's always travelling. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at the old man eating the soup. Is he really an old man? The old man slurps soup while reading a French scientific journal article. He has a large, partly open bag at his side. Travelling soon, maybe. You catch a glance of a German translation dictionary. Hmm. French articles, German translations... The sharp scent of butt jolokia, which is known as ghost pepper, wafts into your nose from the soup. This guy really likes spicy food. Hmm, spices. There are spices that they use in their rituals. He's in good shape for his age. He looks strong and able, even with his thinning white hair. It's all that sort of human flesh, you see. It's good for him. You ask him about Claire Embridge. I think I saw her yesterday, he says. She just got back from London. The man gives you her address and goes back to reading the article. A shining semaphore ring resting on his finger. Ah, and don't they all wear rings? This guy's suspicious. And then the younger man in the back with a drink. The young man is scratching at a peeling rash on his face with swollen pink fingertips. He's got a rash on his face, his skin's coming off, and his fingers are all swollen. The, the, his fingers have been scarred by fish hooks. So he's, he's a fisherman. His dark, sweaty hair is thinning. Despite his young age, he salivates heavily as he takes another swig of his drink. You can smell haddock on him. He stinks of fish. Ugh. You ask him about Claire Embridge. Never heard of her, he says. You notice that he's missing several teeth. OK, let's continue. Let's go to Claire's house, says Ma Oh, Let's go to Claire's house, says Mardler, as he writes down the address of the old man that the old man gave him. Us. <laughs> I agree, you say, your stitch is burning. But first, I have something to say to that young man. You should warn him that he has... Right, so has he got mercury poisoning? Has he got jaundice? Jaun jaundice. Jaundice, which is like when your liver has problems and your skin goes yellow. Or does he have an abdominal parasite? Oh, God. Abdominal parasite, I don't think... I think it's mercury poisoning. Yes, I'm right. You walk over to the man. Take a break on eating fish for a while, you say. The man shoots you a confused look. Huh? You have all the symptoms of mercury poisoning, you continue. Fish are often rich in mercury, and if you keep this up, you could suffer brain damage. You leave the young fisherman to reflect on his eating habits. <laughs> this detective guy is a bit of an annoying... Tw you, stop eating fish. You know, like a bit of a do-gooder. Anyway, we continue. The evening fog has grown thicker as your carriage pulls up to the Embridge estate. Claire Embridge owns a large plot of property. Mardler and the other officers leave you to investigate Claire's home as you stay in the police carriage um, resting. So they go to investigate. You're resting in the carriage. You sit in reflection in the cab, waiting for word from the other officers. 
Then there's that soft, giggling voice of your kidnapper. Oh no, it's Claire's voice. You turn and see Claire Embridge standing in the dense fog outside your carriage, pistol pointed into the carriage. You're a near genius, she whispers. Finding me here like this. Of course it would have helped if you hadn't made so much noise coming up the path. Sorry I have to ambush you like this, but I'm going to get but I'm not going to get caught. But truly I'm thankful that you came to me. I've been dying to eat your heart. How's the boo boo on your back, Brainy? How predictable, you say coldly. An ambush by Claire Embridge. You're really not that original. You realise you already tried pulling this one on me once, right? At the hospital. Worked then too, hisses Claire. How dare you suggest I'm unoriginal. Now get out, you're coming with me. A dark figure appears in the fog behind Claire. Gun cocked and ready. Your loyal partner, Mardler. Drop the gun, Claire, he says. You're surrounded. Smoking a cigarette. Mardler looks over at you. You were right. She tried the same trap as before. She really wants you. Ooh, she really wants me, you, us. Claire chuckles and drops her pistol. She looks deep into your cold eyes. My God, you're brilliant. You must be delicious. She licks her lips and laughs. Ha 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 ha. Your attempts to beat me just make me want you more. You're old news, you say callously. I want your mentor. Who brought Colin Brigham worship to England? Claire has a sickening smile on her face. You won't catch him. He's even smarter than you. He taught me everything I know. You're under arrest, Claire Embridge, says Mardler as he restrains her. The sun sets as you, Mardler, and the other officers go back to the Winterdale Tavern. Mardler orders a meal in celebration for catching Claire. You sit in silence, analysing the case. I hope you men don't need to take the train, says the barkeep in a strange accent. As you, as, as he rubs a dirty cup with a slightly less dirty towel. I heard there was some engine trouble. Mardler looks up from his soup. We have our own carriages. What about that old man? Quentin Lynch, was it? Is he stuck here in Winterdale? Maybe we can give him a ride. After all, he gave us Claire's address. I heard he took his own carriage to London, responds the barkeeper. I guess he was in a hurry. He didn't want the two to uh, be delayed. You begin growing suspicious of Quentin Lynch, the well-travelled old man. What's the rush to London? You're suspicious of the fact that he's probably spent time in... He's either spent time in France, Germany or India. Well, he likes spicy food, so he could be could have spent time in India. I reckon it's India. I reckon he's going to France and maybe going to Germany because he was studying some French texts and translating into German. I think he spent time in India. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Really smart. Nice catch. You're also suspicious of his German translating dictionary or French scientific journal. German translating dictionary, French scientific journal. Have we heard anything about Germany or France so far? We've only had the ger- the, the French uh, perfume. Rare French perfume, French scientific journal. Yes, I got it right. God, I seem to be good at this without being intelligent at all. So, more text story. Mardler glances over at you. He can see that look in your eyes, that look of gears turning and light bulbs illuminating. What's the matter? He asks as he breathes on a hot spoonful of soup and a cigarette. Let's just say, hypothetically, Quentin Lynch is Claire Embridge's mentor. He fits the profile. An older man, well-travelled, lives in Winterdale and was close with Claire, you say. Just because... Just because he's going to London doesn't make him well-travelled, argues Mardler. Where would he have picked up the uh, Colin Brigham teachings, eh? He had but jalokia, a very hot Indian pepper, in his soup. Where did he get that? Certainly not here. And where did he acquire a taste for such spicy food? He would have to live around food like that for a while to grow so comfortable with it. Plus, did you see his hand? He had a... uh, Simophane ring on his finger and cat eye gems like that are good luck in India. It just seems like he spent time abroad. Need I remind you that the Colin Brigham religion originated in India? Lots of standing and pointing in this scene. Oh, that's hardly evidence, says Mardler. Just because he likes spicy food and gems doesn't make him a cannibalistic cobra worshipper, does it? Well, it's odd, you continue. Plus, why leave to London so hastily? 
He already had a train ticket, and it wouldn't have taken long to wait for the train engine to be fixed, yet Lynch took his own carriage through the thick fog to the city. It doesn't make sense, unless he has something specific to go to. He must have a deadline. Do you realise the Fulton Convention is tomorrow? Brilliant scientists from around the world, Europe, I mean, sorry, uh, will be there. One of the scientists was being held captive by Orthrus. We know Lynch has an interest in science because of the scientific article he was reading. Yes, I remember, says Mardler, but that's still a thin memory. Besides, he told us where Claire lives. He betrayed her. Why would a mentor do that? You put your thumb between your teeth in thought. Hmm. Because she'd betrayed him first, you reply. She went to London. Then her and Orthrus made a cannibalistic ways of the religion a public spectacle. Hmm. She's the reason we're snooping around in the first place. She's dead to him now. She let the big secret of Colin Brigham out. OK, so it's her and Orthrus who kind of talked about the secrets of the religion. And now he's sort of pissed off with her. So he, he gave up her, um, her address. OK, so he's the man. <laughs> OK, so the, Ful- the, the, the Fulton Convention, do you remember that? There was a scientist who was going to it. It's going to be like the greatest minds of Europe are going to be there. Surely this guy, I uh, can't remember his name, uh, Lynch, is going to be going there in order to feast on the hearts of these intelligent scientists. Well, we can investigate the Fulton Convention, says Mardler. I suppose if someone wanted to prey on intelligent people, that would be the place to hunt. It begins tomorrow morning. The lot of you return to the police carriages and head back to London, looking for Lynch's cab on the road, but having no luck. You drop off Claire Embridge at a holding cell in Scotland Yard, getting little rest before the sun rises over London. And we cut to the Fulton Convention. Crisp morning air fills your nostrils as you speak with officials at the Fulton Convention. The rented space is bustling with scientists of several nationalities discussing their latest discoveries. There are over 200 scientists here, grumbles Mardler. We can't keep track of everyone. You ask one of the Fulton Convention staff members for a list of guests that failed to arrive. She returns with a short document. We've been tracking who's arrived at the convention so far, she says. There's only been a few late guests. Here are the late guests, three of them. Olaf Hartwin, who's German. He's an oceanographer, 42 years old. He's got two PhDs. Marcel Palomer, French ecologist, 55 years old. He's got three PhDs. Take that, Olaf. And Hadley Hallman, British biologist. He's 50 years old and he's got three PhDs. It could be any of these people, says Mardler, or none at all. They could just be running late. You thought Quentin Lynch fit the profile of Claire's mentor. So which one of these scientists fits the profile of his victim? (sighs) <sighs> oceanographer ecologist or biologist three phds and two phds well german and french why would we why would he be needing to translate to german mm. and also reading some documents as well i think maybe it's marcel paloma because he's been reading his scientific journals and reports and trying to understand them But why would he be needing to translate into German? I do not know. But I'm going to go with Marcel because I think that uh, it's a French connection. Yes, I can't believe I got it right. Let's check on Marcel Paloma first, you say. Lynch wouldn't have to rush to London if he was targeting Hadley Hallman, a native British citizen, because even after the Fulton Convention ends, Hallman will be in the area. I noticed Lynch taking an interest in a French scientific journal back in Winterdale, which undoubtedly had articles published by Paloma. Plus, Paloma has more academic merit than Hartwin. I think he was studying his prey. Prey is like the the thing you're going to catch. The Fulton Convention employee speaks up. Most of the foreign guests are staying at the Dacre Hotel just a few blocks east of here. If you're looking for Paloma, you'll probably find him there. So we head to the Dacre Hotel. You and Mardler take a short cab ride to the Dacre Hotel. You ask at the front desk if Paloma is staying in the hospital. So... We need to find this guy because we think he's going to be a target for Lynch because he seems like brainy, a brainy French uh, man. The Dacre Hotel receptionists confirm that Marcel Palomer is staying in the, host- in the hotel 
They, di- they direct you and Mardler towards his room, number 442. You feel every step up the stairs, stressing your fresh stitches, drops of blood seeping out onto your clothes. Ugh. You feel winded by the time you reach Paloma's door and receive no response to your hasty knocking. Knock, 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 knock. No response. You bring your hand to the doorknob. It's unlocked. There's no one in the room as you push open the door. A cold breeze flutters through the open window as the London air chills. It's cold. But there's a large suitcase in the middle of the room, opened wide. Your eyes drift to a bulky wooden dresser on the wall. He could be on his way to the Fulton Convention, suggests Mardler in a different accent. (laughs) No, he was taken, you respond, as you hobble around the room with your cane. He was taken. Is Liam Neeson going to become involved in this story? He was taken. Was he taken through the window or taken through the door? He must have been taken through the window. Let's, let's just have a little look at the window. You gaze out into, into the sprawling city of London. The temperature seems to be dropping. Marcel Palomer's room is on the fourth floor above a desolate alleyway. So I don't know how he could be taken out of the window. But it's open and it's cold. Why would he have the window open if it's cold? What about the suitcase? This must be Marcel's suitcase. You notice it's totally devoid of clothes. No clothes. Aside from a a stray dirty sock and a shirt, you don't see any other clothes in the room. Funny. Why are all these clothes missing? Um, You notice a small wet spot on the carpet. It's wine. Your keen eyes notice a glint of light. And with some effort, you crouch down and retrieve a small shard of glass embedded in the carpet. You also spot a long, dark hair. Right, someone must have smashed some wine over someone's head. I think it must be Marcel has been whacked over the head with a wine bottle. The wine bottle broke, spilt wine and glass on the floor. And then what about the wooden dresser on the wall? There's a bottle of wine on the dresser, only a quarter of the way full, and a small pick for ice. There's hotel... The hotel provides ice to its guests, but the pick is room temperature. Perhaps it was used last night. An ice pick is something used to, like, break open ice. Besides it, there's an empty glass that's left a coaster mark on the smooth wooden surface of the dresser. There are small traces of wine in the bottom of the glass and faint dried lipsticks uh, on the rim. Beside that, there's another circular coaster mark with a slightly different diameter. Strangely enough, there's no second glass and there are no clothes in the dresser. So, some one with lipstick maybe it's claire but when i don't know when maybe she was there and she smashed ma uh what's his name uh the french dude over the head with a glass uh but what do we what do we need to do was it through the door or the window i think it was through the door i think it's because someone like claire or whatever uh kidnapped him earlier through the door they had a wine. they had wine together maybe she tried to seduce him And then she smacked him over the head. So it's through the door. Yes, I'm right again. Unbelievable. He was taken right out the front door, you say confidently. Look, we we have nothing conclusive, argues Mardler. Why do you think that? There was a scuffle here earlier. Scuffle, like a little fight. And in the fight, Lynch and Palomare broke one of the glasses on the dresser. Oh, so it's Lynch. What about the lipstick, though? One of the glasses, Mardler looks around the room, unconvinced. I only see one glass. Lynch cleaned it up, obviously, you remark, but he left behind a single shard. You know, Mardler, the small piece of glass you found on the carpet. There's a wet spot from the small amount of wine that was spilled. Judging by the dryness, I'd say it was spilled no more than a few hours ago. You're being irrational, says Mardler. Why would Paloma even have two glasses out in the first place? He had a woman over last night, you respond. She's long gone, of course, but she left a faded lipstick stain on the other glass and a long hair on the floor. Just look, Paloma had his drink chilled, judging by the ice pick on the dresser. So the glasses left coaster marks on the dresser. There's two marks, but only one glass. The second glass was knocked off in the scuffle, like I already said, and broken. Mardler sighs. The glass could have been broken last night. Paloma and his guest were drinking wine after all. Just bear with me, Mardler, you say. Look at Palomer's suitcase. There are almost no clothes. He could have been having them washed, Mardler suggests. The hotel offers that service. Then why not wash them all? Why leave a sock and a shirt? And why wash them at all when visiting something as prestigious as Fulton Convention? Palomer can't trust a simple hotel service to wash his nicest clothes. Mixed in with the worst, they could damage them if they didn't wash them with care. And now it's the mystery of the missing clothes, chuckles Mardler. What are you getting at? 
Lynch could have, one, disguised himself as a hotel employee, two, come up to Palomer's room, three, fought with Palomer, breaking the glass, four, put Palomer's body in a laundry cart, along with the clothes to hide him, and the pieces of broken glass to get rid of evidence, then five, carted him through the hotel and out a back exit. Mardler ponders your theory. So he went up disguised as an employee, went in, had a fight, they broke the glass, put the body in the laundry cart, along with the clothes to hide him, and got rid of the broken glass, then went out uh, the back set exit of the hotel. Yeah, it's feasible, isn't it? You walk out into the hallway, Mardler close behind. If I was Lynch, and I needed to move Paloma's drugged body, I'd take him down the service elevator and out a back exit, you say. You go to the front exit and ask about missing employees that are in charge of collecting laundry. Larry Weitzman, a young guy that collects guest laundry, not too reliable, honestly, went home sick earlier, says the receptionist. He didn't look sick, if you ask me, and I'm sure he'll be fired soon. You get Whit- Weitzman's address and continue the hotel investigation. So this guy went home sick. He's the guy who collects the laundry. He's a bit of a dodgy character. You and Mardler walk around the hotel until you're satisfied with a likely escape route for Lynch and emerge out in a rundown London alleyway. A cold London wind blows by you. You take, you, you spot fresh wheel marks from a large carriage, heavy, ju- heavy judging by depth in the ground, taking into consideration distance between wheels, weight, uh, wheel thickness and set of horse hooves from a single horse you mentally recreate the carriage that was there let's have a look at it in our mind it was a heavy one horse clarence carriage judging by the dimensions it was probably the unpopular 1834 model or perhaps the 1835 or 1836 so we're looking at how this uh, french scientist has been kidnapped and taken away um, from the hotel in some sort of carriage mardler wanders over to a sleeping homeless man in the hallway um in the alleyway, sorry. He pushes him with his foot to wake him. Did you see anything happen here in the last few hours? Mardler asks. Did anyone come out of that back exit of the hotel? The homeless man slowly wakes up. Oh, it's hard to remember, he says greedily. Greedily. Mardler, Mardler, Mardler tosses him a few coins. What did you see? An old man uh, left a carriage here a couple of hours ago says the homeless man. Then maybe half an hour later, he came back with a cart of laundry, put it all in his carriage, and then rode out of the alley, taking a right. Do you remember anything else about the carriage, you ask? What colour was it? Anything distinguishing? Uh, it was uh, it was grey with black wheels, says the homeless man. OK. Grey with black wheels... We enter Porter Avenue. You and Mardler travel to the address of Larry Weitzman, the missing hotel employee at Porter Avenue. He comes to his door looking healthy as a horse. He's not ill at all. Are you Larry Weitzman? asks Mardler. Yeah, who's asking? says the young man. This is part of a police investigation, responds Mardler. Why did you leave the Dacre Hotel earlier today? Larry guiltily backs into his untidy apartment. Uh, I'm sick, honest. He feigns a cough (coughs) and a sneeze. He's lying. Let's have a look at his untidy apartment. Most of Larry Weitzman's furniture and possessions are borderline garbage, but you notice several glasses on his cluttered table that look like the ones from the Dacre Hotel. Has he been taking glasses? Threaten to tell the Dacre Hotel that he isn't sick. Threaten to expose his theft. I'm going to threaten to expose his theft. Of course, it's the right choice. Just tell us who... You gave your uniform and laundry cart to, you say, and we won't tell the Daco Hotel you've been stealing silverware and glasses. You point into the rundown apartment at the fine glasses on Larry's table. Larry looks back nervously and sighs. <sighs> OK, so this old guy, white hair and everything, came up to me earlier this afternoon. He offered me £30 to take the day off. As long as I let him use my stuff, I figured he was just some crazy guy with money to burn. That's got to be Lynch, you say to Mardler in his accent. <laughs> he wouldn't kill someone this stupid because it goes against his Colin Brigham teachings. Uh, what are you talking about? Are you talking about me? Mumbles Larry in confusion. We're done here, says Mardler. Go back to work, slacker. <laughs> oh God. Okay. So the the investigation continues. How long is this going to go on for? I don't know. Um, 
it's nearing noon so I, I guess i've got about another 10 minutes before we have maybe another cliffhanger ending it's nearing noon as you gather up a large task force of london police officers your back is aching painfully but you fight to show no weakness you describe quentin lynch's appearance and give a description of his carriage you don't have much time to catch him but you want every officer to know what to be looking for one officer speaks up do we have a the general location of where this quentin leach character might be you respond to the group, right, so where is he? He's in a lower to middle class German neighbourhood, lower to middle class Polish neighbourhoods, middle to upper class German neighbourhoods or middle to upper class Polish neighbourhoods. So he's been translating stuff into German. He must be in an upper class German neighbourhood because the dude is uh, he's an upper class character, isn't he, right? He's got to be an upper class German neighbourhood. That's what I'm going for. No, I'm wrong. Damn. He was brushing up on German translations when we last saw him. You continue. Plus, he mentored a woman that bought a house to perform her murderous rituals. She picked a mainly Polish neighbourhood to disorient her victim. Of course, Claire Embridge had underestimated your linguistic ability. Marcel Palomer may be more easily confused by a foreign neighbourhood. She learned everything she knows about killing from Lynch, so it's likely that he was the one that taught her that, you say. OK, so it's a Polish neighbourhood. Offers Officers... That's where we're going to find Lynch. Officers disperse throughout London on a manhunt for Quentin Lynch. Meanwhile, you're stuck at Scotland Yard revisiting clues from the case. Travelling all the way to Winterdale put a lot of stress on your wound. And what you need now is rest. Hours pass by and there's still no developments in the search for Lynch. The sun begins to dip below the horizon as you rise from your seat and put on your coat. The bitter London wind greets you as you leave Scotland Yard. Time to get some sleep and look at this case with fresh mind in the morning. You sit in a handsome cab as it rattles down the cold streets. If Quentin Lynch acts as you predict and stays within the ritual, there'll be another mutilated body in the morning. Your nose perks up as that familiar smell hits your nose. <laughs> the distinct odour of incense. Hmm. That smell of incense. You stop the cab and stumble out into the street, following your sharp nose. There in front of you is a small Indian herb store. You can pick out the smell of the incense that Clyde Orthrus and Claire Embridge used. Could be, could this be where they bought it? You limp into the shop and talk to the store owner. You describe Quentin Lynch's appearance and ask if a man fitting that description has recently purchased the particular incense that you recognise. The store owner scratches his chin for a moment. Why, yes, he says, there was an old man here earlier today in the, in, in the early afternoon. He bought about 30 pounds of incense and other goods and then left. Did he make any indication about where he was going, you ask? Was there anything suspicious about him, anything at all? The store owner reflects again for a long moment. Well, he was clearly cold, shivering and rubbing his hands together, and he was slightly out of breath. He took a left when he exited the store, I'm pretty sure. So Quentin Lynch is probably staying near here or far from here. Bloody hell, how am I supposed to know that? Near here or far from here. He was cold, shivering, rub his ha rubbing his hands together, slightly out of breath. Is he just taking a long walk to get there? Uh, I'm assuming he went on foot. If he was cold, it must be a far, far away. I'm going to say far away. No, I'm wrong again. Oh, God, I'm losing it. Quentin Lynch was cold and out of breath, so he probably walked to the Indian herb shop. Well, I'm assuming he walked a long distance. Then he bought 30 pounds of goods. Ah, of course, so he doesn't live so far that carrying the box would be a great burden. You thank the store owner and leave the store going left as Lynch did, mentally visualising a map of London. You recall that Anton Street, a mostly German neighbourhood, is nearby. This, of course, connects you to Lynch's German translating dictionary. You decide to investigate the neighbourhood. We've only got about five minutes left. The streets of London are growing dark as you hike through Anton Street. Your cane holds you up, the chilling wind biting at your collar. There aren't many people on the street, aside from the occasional passing carriage, a few walking Londoners and a man taking a smoke break outside his handsome cab. Eureka! You've got it! You see a carriage outside a small house that matches the one that left the Dacre Hotel. Remember the homeless man he described it? An 1835 Clarence carriage, grey with black wheels. 
you carefully approach the house, the faint aroma of incense emanating from within. The Columbregem ritual could begin at any moment, if it hasn't already started. You walk to the door and begin fiddling with the lock. This scenario seems justifiable as probable cause. You can't accept another casualty. Click. The jaw gently swings open. And you begin sneaking through the house, pistol in hand. You ascend the stairs to the second floor, following the sound of a muffled conversation. You reach the source of the noise, ear pressed against the secondary story door, hand tightly gripping the door handle. It sounds like two men speaking, and one of them is begging for his life. Time to act. You push the door open. And that is where we're going to end part two of this murder mystery detective story. Another cliffhanger. What's going to happen? Are we going to find, what's his face, Lynch in there with his victim, the French dude? Um, What's going to happen? Are we going to save the guy's life? Are we going to solve this? And how long is this story going to go on for? I've no idea. But that's the end of part two. Thank you so much for listening. And... I'm not going to waffle on now at the end of the episode. I'll just say part three is going to be available to you very, very soon. And you'll be able to check that out in due course. But for now, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And I'll speak to you in the next one. But for now, goodbye. Bye. 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 Right. That's the end of the audio. The video is still going here. But um, this is this is turning into an absolute epic. But I hope that you're enjoying the video. But that's it for this one. And I'll speak to you in the next one. But cheers for now. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.